said Ernest just came out the house and like saying it's gonna be okay, mom. And he went into custody of the of the police in '99, and now we're in 2023, and he's never been out of that. Right. Ever from the age of 17, Lamar decides to play take the stand, which is uh you know either courageous or really not very intelligent, you know, thought out right. because you got to convince a jury that not only am I uh, not guilty, but I'm telling you, I'm a shooter. He right. gets up on the stand and says, I have a gun and I shot at them and I had met him. So I knew him around the yard and I read his case and I was like, dude, this is the first you are in prison for a non-crime because you can't have murder if the shooter is acquitted of self-defense right and he was like wait what hey this is matt cox and i am here with jay whitmore and he is a peer support specialist and we're going to be talking about the ernest jackson case um and i i will let I will let Jason uh, explain in more detail. So check it out. Ernest is a guy that was found guilty of being at a murder that he says he wasn't there. No. And no. there's tons of evidence that says he wasn't there. And yet he's still in prison because essentially um, you believe, or I guess everybody pretty much involved in it believes that that the district attorney or you know the state in general doesn't want to release him because they would have to then of course they would have to pay him um for being wrongfully incarcerated for how many years uh over two decades now Since okay 99. um all right so and it, it, anyway so they're completely resistant to it and, and this has happened over and over again throughout like throughout the country where prosecutors they don't want to release guys because their their fear is if i re if we release them or if it you know it, it, you know and the evidence shows that you know he was set up or it was a wrongful prosecution then we have to pay him depending on what state some states have caps where they say look we owe the guy twelve thousand dollars a year some of them say eighty thousand a year some of them have no no legislation and they end up just negotiating it and I know in the past from just seeing different types of documentaries and reading different articles and books where sometimes they say, hey, we'll let you go, but you have to promise not to sue us, which typically doesn't hold up, but they try it anyway. Yeah. Um, anyway, did you ever see read the book uh, An Innocent Man? I think there's a documentary on it, too. Uh, I think I've seen the documentary. Yeah, but it was with that being said right here, right now. There's a guy touring around that has. And I might not have the name exactly right, but his name is Daniel, Daniel Medwid, M-E-D, like W-E-D. He's a professor and he wrote a book, Why Innocent People Can't Get Out of Prison. Right. And he's actually down here uh, at the at the colleges we got, you know, talking and whatnot. And I'm going to meet up with him later on because he also found out Ernest's case, uh, Ernest Jackson, that we're going to be talking about. And you might hear me say Nesto. That's a nickname I gave him. So sometimes I slide into that because I've myself done a lot of time. But right. this professor is down here. And yeah, he writes this. He wrote this whole book about why innocent people can't get out of prison in our system. Right. You're 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 basically you're um, you're an advocate for. Absolutely. For I'm an advocate in the community, period. That's kind of my growth, my long stuttered growth from the system, because I didn't just go there and hide my head. I was I was terrible. But. I put all my all my energy into something else now. Right. And so this was a case that I seen and I know we'll get into it, but this was a case that, you know, I met him and I was reading law trying to figure out how to beat my stuff, even though I was guilty. And I read his case and it just blew me away because you hear about innocent people, but you always hear these like shady parts, whether, you know, you can always say there's a gray area. Right. Oh, we don't know this or they're not innocent because it was a procedural thing with his co-defendant and blah, 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 where the the kicker in this case that we'll get to is uh, this is a, he's guilty of a crime. That's not a crime. Now, might okay. not make sense. <laughs> right. 
to you you know a little bit about the case but it's a crime that's not a crime let alone all the other stuff and it's a horrible case but yeah so i'm a community advocate and i just kind of try to bring the light to like for instance people go in for doing terrible stuff and i know guys with like extraordinarily horrible cases and then as i grow because i got about 20 years in myself i've seen guys that if I just looked at their case, I couldn't see the person that actually I'm interacting in the yard. That's out reaching out to the brothers. That's just trying to be a guy reading books and talking to you on the level and not doing whatever life he had before he got came to the system. So, right. Human um, nature is, it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> to say the um, least. <laughs> oh, yeah. Listen, I've I've met numerous guys in prison and you're talking to them and then suddenly you go, what are you here for, bro? And then they tell you, and you're like wow like i didn't see that like that yeah. that that was not mm. not what i saw coming um okay so so tell me about uh about ernest like where was he born how you know what kind of childhood that sort of thing like how yeah. did he yeah nesto and uh i don't know a ton about his childhood i do know he was born in 81 i believe in right right in our right in our state omaha nebraska yeah okay. so north in in uh Nebraska, where I'm at, where we're at, uh, right in the middle of the country. Uh, our biggest city is is Omaha, and then our capital, the second biggest city, is Lincoln. I currently live in Lincoln, and that's where our biggest prisons are in in Lincoln, and then some little town they put a big big one out there. Uh, but he was born in North Omaha, and that's basically where uh, a lot of redlining. So that's where a lot of the the, the hoods are, north and south are the part of Omaha that are most got most of the stuff going on. And he was born on the north side with uh or in about I think it was October at 81. Cause I know they uh celebrate his birthday. Very athletic kid, sports. He has one of them families where his mother and his 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 aunt, her sister, they like their kids are like like this. Whoever's house they at, they at mom's house. So, you right. know, if there's punishment coming, they can punish how they want, how they see fit. And the other other mom, you know, they know. And that's kind of uh, something that comes up because they have one of them families where it doesn't matter if you're at aunt's house or mom's house. You're at the same house. So, so he was raised by both of them. He was he was definitely raised by both of them in a in a bad neighborhood. Yep. In a yep. In one of the city neighborhoods where things are going down and there's not a lot of service unless somebody's coming there to regulate. And so he has to navigate that, you know? And uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, born in 81, has a good family. His mom's very, very, uh, very uh, spiritual lady, Brenda Jackson. He has, and I might get it wrong because I don't know if I met all of them, but I believe it's, I know I met, he got two sisters and a brother. I don't believe there's any other one. He got a big family, lots of cousins, a lot of, you know, expanded family. So he has two sisters, Star and and uh, Remy. Remy's the youngest sister, Star's the oldest, and then his brother. And they all lived in Omaha. I think some of them moved to Arizona along with his mom had moved to Arizona. What was that mean? Was he, you know, when he grew up, was he in trouble? Uh, was he in a gang? Uh. It wasn't ever in a gang uh, growing up in the city, especially if, once you get caught up in the system, you're always everybody believes you're in the gang. And if you join the gang life, you're on a fast track to prison because the whole mentality and all the push that's behind that drives you into places that don't turn out well for none of us. The best right. thing that could happen for us is to get mature before we get caught up, you know, and wake up a little bit before we get caught up in a different course. But uh he was, you know, he did run with his friends and I don't know if he had any, ever had any legal trouble. I'm sure he probably has some misdemeanors or whatnot. I actually don't know his, his, her, his record like that, but he, nothing major. Uh, again, wasn't a gang member, but he's pretty much pigeonholed to that because, you know, he has, because it's the hood. Right. I, it doesn't matter if I'm a gang member. You can best believe if I got a few friends, one or two or whatever is a gang member and whoever I'm standing with when things get happen, that's who I'm associated with. And you can get stuck up in them moments. And if somebody gets in trouble, as we're going to see, 
and we know them or we're associated to them, guess who's coming to investigate us to pull that into into that trouble? So how how did he end up getting in trouble? I mean, he like how did that happen? Yeah, so ninety nine, I believe it was October ninety nine, right up his his uh again that's about the same time when he was born. So in ninety nine, he's seventeen, and uh. A young man named Larry Perry, also 17, I believe, is shot and killed out on the north side of Omaha, as we spoke about. And the next day, essentially, he comes to find out, hey, the police want you for a shooting death. <laughs> they want to talk to um, Ernesto. Ernesto. Ernesto for a shooting death. And that's the word on the street because his friend, which is Shalomar Cooper Ryder and Dante's Chillis, are getting arrested and charged for the shooting death. They're arrested at the time. Nobody really knows what's going on, but that's essentially what it is, is this young man gets shot and he's killed. And so Ernest, you know, his mom, at first, you know, he doesn't turn himself in right away, which I know I know people, uh, they, they, they think like, why would you not just turn yourself and talk to the police? Uh, I just had an incident here last year where I had a knock on my door and when I looked out the window, the sheriff was out there and my first instinct was to duck down. And I literally was thinking like, I'm, I'm gonna run. <laughs> and then I've like came to my senses cause I haven't, I've been, I've been good and clean for like six years. My badness is my advocacy for, you know, change and doing something different. And, but I, but I get it. Some people don't understand that. Even I at the moment didn't understand like, why would you run? So when somebody said the police coming for you, you know, and the police ain't there talking to you, especially if you're a kid and you're living a life because we run from the I remember running from the police, not doing nothing when I was a kid. Here come the police. We just run. Right. Kind of. <laughs> so, yeah, he didn't turn himself in right away, but they did come get him. I don't know when at his, it was at his mom's house and he's been known to cure insecurity just with his laugh. His organ donation card lists his charisma. His smile is so contagious. Vaccines have been created for it. He is the most interesting man in the world. I don't typically commit crime, but when I do, it's bank fraud. Stay greedy, my friends. Support the channel. Join Matthew Cox's Patreon. I was talking to his mom. She said uh, they was uh, he was inside and She's like, yeah, you're not gonna, you're not gonna take my boy, and they were gonna get the dogs, and that's when I think his stepdad stepped in and was like, no, <laughs> don't let's. And then they, then she said, Ernest just came out the house and like saying it's gonna be okay, mom, and he went into custody of the uh, of the police in '99, and now we're in 2023, and he's never been out of that, right, ever from the age of 17. Yeah. Well, so they they took him. Obviously, they they took him downtown. I mean, they did he get a uh, did he get like a lawyer right away? Well, why did they you know nope. like why did they think he was involved? Because um, his buddies were involved. Like you guys yeah. are a tight group. They killed. They they were there or they were involved. So you had to be involved or. Well, I I my understanding is they had somebody else starting to say. They was making associations as well as I guess they developed somebody that was starting to make accusations of like, it wasn't me. It was this person and this person. And when it started, uh, they didn't, he didn't know Ernest Jackson other than, you know, the, the neighborhood, even in the city is like, it's not that big either. You get to hear names, even if you don't really get to know each other. And that's how his name got caught. It came in through another person that was, a suspect starting to become a uh, prosecutor witness. Alexis Fulton is the name of the, the young man. Also, I don't know how old he was, but I'm sure he was also another young man. So uh, he, he just immediately said, no, nah, it wasn't me. It was so-and-so, or I heard it was so-and-so. No, they, no, from my understanding, he did not immediately say that. And uh, he went through that whole process of seeing mug shots and whatnot and mug shots. Uh, from from one one of the lawyers that I spoke to was like the mugshots consistently involved Ernest Jackson, Dante Chillis, and Shalomar Cooper Ryder, who are the three that ultimately ended up charged with the case. 
So they didn't have, they it didn't like a shooting happen. And one hour later, like we know who did it. Right. You know, it, it was, it developed, it developed pretty quick because it was in the neighborhood and people were, there was other names thrown out there. Most of which is learned later on when Shalomar Cooper Ryder, which is a name that should be, is very relevant in this case, Shalomar, uh, when he goes to trial. But Ernest went there downtown by himself. And I mean, he talked to the lawyer. I mean, talked not lawyer, sorry. He didn't have a lawyer. He talked to the police and he told him where he was at, and w- which was at his aunt's house with his little cousin playing video games. And that's never changed. His family verified that, his aunt verified that, you know, and then so then we fall in that that element of, yeah, well, we don't believe family. Right. <laughs> you know? So, so okay, so I mean, so he denied it the whole time. If you're saying he he never, because you know, sometimes guys will admit it, they'll get him in there for, you know, six hours straight and yep. you know, convince them that to to just own up to it or at least say you were there help us out you know and then they end up you know you're 17 you're scared you're like oh okay i was there um um you know they end up placing a a a scenario in your head you know if you if you saw the uh i don't know if you saw that documentary um uh to making a murder yeah where they get the cousin who's who's honestly not that sharp obviously he's what 14 years old and not that you know not that savvy and he they convince him to say that his uncle did the murder and he was there yeah you know so that's 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 the scenario of you you when you started you were speaking about how uh if they admit guilt the sit the state admits guilt in like hey we messed with this evidence we did this or this person doesn't belong here and then they're like hey that person sat for years you should <laughs> they need some compensation for their life because they didn't just lose a little bit of time. They lost movement in, in the world. So with that being said, and you and you're saying about the, the uh, confessions when they talk to him and whatnot, we have what's named the Beatrice Six. And Beatrice is a small town not too far from Lincoln. And back in the 80s, and I don't know all the details, but like five of them, uh, five, five youngsters were charged with a, an elderly lady's murder. I think they had sexually assaulted her and murder and whatnot. And they brought them in and they were saying they didn't do it, but they got worked for a while. And then they started saying, you know, and then, yeah, I was just there. Yeah. This person was doing this and this, except for one, he kept saying like, I'm not a part of this. I'm not a part. I didn't have nothing to do with this. And they just made a documentary on HBO, like one of them docu docu series and all that stuff. And so from my understanding is, Basically, there's this private eye that kind of continuously walked them through the scenario that he believed happened. And they they evolved with the scenario as it went, the finger pointing. And they did about 20 years. All of them, you know, they went from young faces to the elderly. And then they got out. And then there was this huge lawsuit with a huge settlement that ba- that pretty much bankrupt the, the county, Beatrice, the city of Beatrice, whatever county that's in. And that became a big political f- fiasco because one, you got them confessing and stuff and there's a lot of gray area. So you have a lot of people that believe that, no, they are guilty. You know, then you got other people that are like, look at what this guy did. He manipulated it, made this case in the what shouldn't have happened. So there's a lot of emotions there. And then now we got to pay all these people. Well, you know, a lot of people just think they think no matter what, I, I would never I would never do that. I would never. I would never admit that. I would never admit, you know, something I did not listen, bro. You know, you haven't been in that room. You, you're not a kid. You're not being, you know, you're, you're, you're a savvy, you know, intelligent, confident man that knows that you weren't involved and what not to say. But if you're a scared kid, you know, yeah. and, and these guys are telling you, you know, you need to help, you need to this, you need to that. And you start thinking, well, I, I want to help and I'm not, these guys aren't letting me leave. Like if, yeah. if I, I need it, like you're thinking, well, if I say something, you'll let me go. Kind of like the, the guy on make a murder. Like he, he thought he was going home. He thought, okay, so if I just admit that I was a part of it, then I can go home. Right. And they were like, what? Well, yeah, let's go ahead and let's talk about that. What, what happened? Like, yeah. it's like, oh, okay. So he's assuming, and that happens. They had a, a I, I watched a whole video on these, this kid that, that was like 16 or 17 years old. They convinced him that he had murdered his sister. 
Jeez. He admits to it. He admits to killing her, stabbing her, that he hated her, that like they're, they're like, well, you know, at, fir at first it's known. He's like, no, no, no. I love my sister. I love my sister. Seven hours later, he's telling you, I've always hated her. My parents love her more. I wanted her dead. I, I mean, he just completely flips. They over the course of about six, seven hours, they completely flip him signs of confession, everything. Yeah. And, and, and to, to what you're saying is, uh, it doesn't take kids. Adults do it all the time. Yeah. I, I, I call a case like that too. Yeah. I've seen a case like that too. When, they, when they say about the, the, uh, ask for a lawyer and plead the fifth. Yeah. Everybody thinks that, that, you know, don't do that, 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 you know, it sounds good. Yeah. It makes you look, when they, I they, didn't do nothing. Makes, they think it makes you look guilty. Yeah. And then wow. they say stuff and then they find out, Hey, this person's investigating to see what happened. They ain't investigating. They're not looking for uh, innocence. They're looking for guilt. And in every little, you know, but when a lawyer comes in, there is nothing wrong with taking a breath, put my lawyer in between whatever the system does. And if I want to talk, there'll be a day to talk, but I can talk where I know, hey, I'm not stumbling into something. <laughs> and I see it happen all the time. People complying with things and whatnot. You, you can watch them on TV and it doesn't do do well. I can just say we have this political thing about anti-police, pro-police, but they are an entity. When the bottom line is there's people in uniforms, but they're an entity. And when we won't allow the, 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 the higher levels of accountability in this entity that's armed and supposed to be safe, that says something about our compliance. Right. You know? We're yeah. thinking we're just being loyal, but like that's com that's the type of compliance that if this entity goes rogue, you're still going to comply because Nazi Germany didn't become Nazi Germany because Overnight, everybody yeah. there was bad people. Yeah, I was going to say it's it's funny. It's like if somebody not if a police officer knocks on the door and says, "Hey, did you see anything last night?" Like I, of course, yeah, you know, no, I didn't see anything. I did. Well, why? What? Yeah. What's going on? That's different. Like I understand answering that question did you know your your neighbor's car was broken this last night did you hear anything like i get it I, I but if they say hey we're picking you up we're taking you downtown we're questioning and we think we may have been involved in this then it'd be like oh wow bro like you're not here on a basic um a, a you know a, a breaking and entering you know you're not here yeah. on, a, on a car theft like you you're trying to and you're not and you brought me downtown like you're not asking for my help in finding the person that did this because maybe it's somebody I knew, maybe I was at the mall when this happened. Like you're saying I was involved. I need to talk to a lawyer. Yeah. Because right now you're not trying that. to exclude me. They always say that. Well, we're just trying to exclude you. Stop it. <laughs> you're, not, you're killing me with yeah. that exclusion. You don't want to exclude me. You want me to be your guy. I mean, what what is the what does it say? Anything you say can and will be used against you. Yeah. It doesn't say anything you say could clear you, but if you're yeah. guilty, it's going to be used against you. <laughs> None of them words are in there like that. So what so. what happened with 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 Ernesto? I mean, he got down there. Did did I mean, he just stuck stuck to his guns? He, yeah, he's never changed that. There's not right. even and you've been a, you 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 openly said you've been in the system. Yeah. Yep. Okay. In the correction system. And when cases are fouled up, a lot of times there's that, that, that gets talked about in the system at some point before people move on, especially when people are like, dude, actually didn't do this. Or we think somebody across town did this. And a lot of us know such and such, you know, that there's, there's never, I've never, ever heard anybody talk about, you know, actual like belief that he could have did this. The closer there ever been, it's like, I don't really know what happened in this case. And as it came out, people are, you know, the whole prison system were basically like, dude, <laughs> this, little, this dude didn't, you know, he shouldn't have been here. And he stuck to his guns because I believe he was genuinely telling the truth, not just because I know him. But this is one of them things like, I don't know where my life would have went. Maybe I would have ended up joining gangs by the time I was 18 and got into some bullshit. But I wasn't. And right. I didn't shoot nobody. And I wasn't involved in the shooting. So, you know, but I'm going to be guilty of that. And that's exactly what what's going to happen to him as that time moves forward with him. So he's never changed that, but they kept him in custody. They kept all three of them. So they charged three again. Ernest, the one we're talking mostly about. Shalomar, whose who's, uh, trial is 
key element besides Ernest is on trial. And then Dante is kind of uh, just a third third case that comes up. And it's not really a big deal other than to validate what happened in Shalimar Cooper Ryder's trial. And so they charged all three of them. No bond. So they charged all three of them with first degree murder and use of a weapon to commit a felony. And first degree murder is essentially the same all over the country where it has that element of premeditated. And what they do is they use a uh, uh, felony murder rule, essentially what it's called. And the felony murder rule means if a felony occurs, if we can prove any type of felony and somebody dies in any way that can be associated to this felony, that can prove that proves the first degree murder that sticks. All other elements are out. OK, so in like 85, we have this case. Shahid. No, I know him now. as Shahid. Derek Dixon is his name in 85. I believe that's the exact year, but it was in the early 80s. He committed burglary when he was like 20 and an elderly lady had a heart attack. So all they needed to do is prove burglary happened. Heart attack. First degree murder based on the felony murder rule. He's doing like he was not 17. So there was a law. So I say that because juveniles about 15 years ago, they said if they have mandatory life sentences, the mandatory needs to get took off in resentencing. He wasn't 17. He was 20. So that mandatory didn't matter. It stuck. He's still doing life without parole for a burglary at 20. He's like 50 something. And uh, <laughs> yeah. And I can't imagine that because, you know, yes. If I'm the if that that old that elderly lady was my family member, I'm gonna be bitter and angry at him and think he gets what he deserves. But if I stepped away, a burglary where a heart attack happens, every community has kids that go and mess around. And uh yeah, no, I, know, I understand. So easy. That's the type of rule that could wrap up anybody's kid. And as we know, privilege whether you have all the money in the world or not can sometimes not work because somebody now the example needs to be made to show, Hey, we're not doing that. Nobody should allow something like this to be in the books and it, and it, and it's, it's in the books. It's a lot of States have it. So, okay. So, so he, they, there was no bond. They're not giving them bond. No, nope. first degree. How do they have, what's the story that the police believe occurred and why do they believe like what's the scenario there? There, you know, typically they formulate some kind of a, a, um, you know, their theory of the crime. What is their theory of the crime? Yeah. So the theory is, uh, these three: Ernest, Shalomar, Dante, went up, met with uh, Larry Perry for whatever reason. I think to confront him, and uh, about stolen tires, stolen rims and gotten got into an argument and then shot and killed young larry and then all ran off that's 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 just, that's the whole gist of the 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 theory and do, do they have anything that puts them there i mean they have anything anybody that puts them there yep and so what they'll have is uh a uh, individual named alexis fulton alexis is like e x e it's a weird spelling of his name but uh, and I don't know how old he was, but I'm pretty sure he was pretty young too. And it's it shows that he went in, they picked him up as a suspect as well. And at some point, uh, he became the individual that could identify people. However, from my understanding, is he could not identify the people in the mug shots to start out with. Okay. You know, and they've they've repeatedly showed these mug shots and. I also, from my understanding, uh, one of the lawyers is Ernest, Shalomar, and Dante's mugshots seem to circulate quite a bit sometimes, you know, <laughs> which is goes to that part where, you know, that starts, to, you know, that's probably the person that did it, I guess. Definitely not me. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know what I mean? I can't imagine to be terrified, like, oh, these people are going to prosecute me, whatever they said. And so he becomes, Alexis Fulton becomes key witness of the state and what the state does again they charge first degree murder and the use of a weapon and 
they said they were going to put them all together to try them at one. But Ernest and his lawyer, as should have happened, were like, no, because our fates are sealed together and friends are not. I wasn't with them. You know right. what I mean? They're, whatever is going on with them is going on with them. I was literally at home playing video games. I wasn't with them. And I go there to go trial together. I'm now fighting a case of what they may have been involved in. Yeah, I, I know a guy that got like 15 years. He worked at the place like there were like three guys that are running a place that were like it was like a tax scam. And this guy was making phone calls thinking what he was doing was legal. They had him convinced that it was legal. So when they all got indicted, they ended up going to trial. And this guy sat there. He said his name was literally mentioned two or three times during a week long trial. And when they suddenly found found all of them guilty mm -hmm. and he gets the same amount of time that everybody else got, even though he was just an employee. But none of those guys took the stand to say, yes, we did it. He doesn't know anything. We convinced this guy what he was doing was legal. So because of that, he sat with the other guys that are guilty and got the same time. Mm. He's like, they never mentioned my name. Like I was on the indictment. But he's like, there's nothing that says I'm a part of any of this other than making calls that I thought were legal phone calls. I was telling them what these guys are telling me. Okay. But, you know, he didn't take the stand. He couldn't take the stand. Yeah. You know, he was it was just it's just such a bad situation all the way around. Like his lawyer was like, don't take the stand, because if you take the stand, then they're going to ask you, did you make the calls? And you're going to say yes. He's like, yeah, but I can explain why. He's like, they're not going to care. You've already been indicted. You know, that nobody's going to care what, that that you thought that like that's going to sound like a lie. Of course, his lawyer was court appointed. He didn't want to be there. He didn't want to do this. He certainly doesn't want to have to prep you and, and have to spend two days, um, you know, questioning you. He wants this to be over as quick as possible. He really just wants to sit beside you and let this case play out and let you go to jail. And that's what happened. Yeah. The guy got like 15 years. But anyway, so I, I totally get that. Um, so, OK, so so what was the what was the next thing that happened? So the next thing is, uh, cause we repeatedly asked like, how, how did Ernest end up being tried first? Right. They, they clearly know his side cause he's never changed that. I'm not there. So why right. try him first? But they were saying it was, it had to do with the docket number. So by being tried first, this is the, the, the worst thing that could have happened to him. Uh, besides being charged with this case, of course, is by being tried first, Everybody else and their lawyers, Fifth Amendment. We're not. Yeah. We got the right to defend ourselves, and we have a murder trial. So coming up, we're not gonna. Yeah. I'm not gonna get on the stand. I'm not gonna say he wasn't there. Yeah, then nobody can say he wasn't there. But him and his family, who you know, again, that's family, and uh, nobody can say you know whatever other scenarios might have happened. Nothing, because because uh, his only defense is I'm not there, so I don't know what else to say. I can't yeah, sit there and to... talk about self-defense or nothing because I don't know nothing about that other than when I'm sitting in jail, maybe what I've heard in jail. But what good is that? I wasn't there. I'm not a part of this. Right. And so the, the other guy gets on the, the other guy gets on the stand. Then the other guy, this so this Alexis Fulton gets on the stand, and his key testimony is at the time of the shooting, he says, Ernest Jackson, Shalmar Cooper Ryder. Dante Chillis, we're all there. I see them argue. I'm looking, I think he said he's like looking through a window. He came there, seen them. Then he was in this building and looking out this window and see them uh, shoot Larry, young the young man, Larry Perry, shoot and kill him after an argument and run off. He describes uh, what's Ernest wearing, some dark clothes and describes his hair. And I can't remember if it's braids or brush cut, which one version it is. But all of them have relevance because as they're talking, you know, they draw these things out and they go over them, over them. They're not exciting like the movies when you try to read the transcript. Right. But uh, as they're talking, he goes back. He describes how he first sees them, apparently. Earlier in the day, uh, they come over. Ernest, Shalomar, and Dante come over, arguing with Larry early in the day. And Ernest gets mad and pistol whoops. Larry, the, the young man that died. So that's a key thing, because we know there's not 
there's not many little pistols that don't do damage because them are solid material. So right. apparently he pistol whoops him and there's no evidence of this pist this, you know, pistol whooping for anybody that don't know, you getting hit with the 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 usually the butt of the gun. Boom. Right. Like a hammer. And there's no sign of that. Right. On on the, on his the, body. On his body. So that was blatant lie. That was easily proved. And then as we go, we're going to find out in the next trial, which I'll say now is the clothing he described is what Shalimar Cooper Ryder had on. So, okay, so he's describing someone else. Wasn't right. Yeah, so he's actually describing, you know, uh, uh, another defendant in this case who is a part of this, who will, you know, who is a part of this case, you know, in one way or another. And then there's family members there and a friend and both of them openly admit and they're with larry perry and they're like you know we couldn't identify nobody but this guy <laughs> apparently he could right and i don't even know you know i don't know his case because i don't know where he's at or whatnot uh but who you don't know and once you're stuck you're stuck you start talking and start admitting the things and start thinking you're part of this or are lying on somebody and now you're going to trial you know what's going to happen if you start saying like, uh, yeah, I don't really know this stuff. Well, I mean, but I don't know the st story at this point too. the, you know, I'm sure he's being told by law enforcement that he's helping them, that the, you got, trust me, you did the right thing. These are bad guys. This is what happened. This is what we believe happened. We thought we, we you know, we, there's lots of evidence against them, but the truth is he, he probably, you know, he has no clue. Yeah. Um, and they also had him picked up first, so he yeah, he, yeah, he, he may he may have also been case. facing something. Yeah, yeah, he may have been facing something himself. So, so then what? So, all right. So, what happens at Ernesto's trial? So then the jury, with the so they got this first degree, which all they got to do is prove that a felony happens in accessory to a a, a homicide is a is a felony, and then the gun and what they do is they look at all the evidence as they do and whatnot. And they came back and they believe, like, we believe you're not the shooter. So they acquit him of the gun. However, as horrible as this is, you know, we're giving you a life sentence because there's nothing else that comes with first degree because we believe you were there. Right. You know, you're going to tell us you're there and your family's going to, I mean, you're going to tell us you're not there. Your family's going to tell you you're not there. And we're supposed to believe this. But, but the prosecution. You're know, a little black kid in a in the in the hood, and another little black kid gets shot and death, and we know that stuff happens all the time. And these guys apparently are your friends. Like we just believe you're there. All right. So the prosecutor is saying you did it, and we've got a witness that says he was there and saw you do it. Yep. Do they have any other any any other um, uh, witnesses? Nope. Do like I said, the other witnesses were said. They said like no, nobody could be identified. So like we don't really know exactly what happened. Um, so how long was the trial? Uh, probably a couple of days. I don't know how exactly how long it was. I guess one of the other elements that came out is Larry Perry had a gun on it. That that'll come into play in the next uh, the next trial because this trial is just about I'm not there and this guy saying I'm not there and then we destroy his. His testimony, the, the defense lawyer just, you know, pistol whooping. That's physical. That's a that's, you know, best thing you can do is where we don't have to debate your words. You're just lying on the physical, the description, the hair. You got the hair wrong. You know, he wasn't wearing that. But I don't know how we argue that he was just at home. Right. And so but as far as countering a witness, they did all that. But again, the jury is like, we just believe you're there. And that's guilt by association is, you know, what else we do? What I'm thinking is reasonable doubt means even when you're believing, I don't, I don't, I, don't, right. I, I, can't, I, I, I think you might have been running with your friends, but you got doubt there. You're supposed to be like, man, you, you use believe. reasonable doubt to give up. Don't stick a person in a box without knowing for sure, especially on this case. But that didn't happen for him. So okay, so he's found guilty. He's found guilty. He got guilty of first degree. The he's. His sentencing doesn't happen for like a year, but it's mandatory. It comes first degree comes with mandatory life sentence. 
So there's no doubt about what they're going to give him. And about the same time he's about to get sentencing, Shalimar Cooper Ryder goes on trial. And Shalimar Cooper Ryder's trial will end the day that Ernest Jackson is sentenced. Hmm. And everybody's trial has the same judge. Different, different juries, of course, because that's how that works. The same judge. So the judge knows what's happening in all these trials as he sits and does what he does, which is very interesting because Shalimar Cooper Ryder trial is like something you would put in a movie. Like <laughs> it's just extraordinary what happens there. You was going to say? I, I was going to say. So at at the other at. OK, what happens at the other trial? Yeah. OK. Shalimar Cooper Ryder goes to trial second. He. uh he, of course, him and the other defendant who will go later on uh, pled the fifth to Ernest case. You know, they try to pull him in, but you can't, you know, Ernest has the right to defend himself. But that doesn't overcome the right for somebody to say, I got the right to remain silent because I got to defend myself as well. So they don't he doesn't get whatever this man has to say. So Shalomar goes to trial. He decides at some point in the trial. I'm going to take the stand. And so we got another young black man, young black man from the hood saying he shot another one, going to take the trial from a jury that I'm sure hardly matches his people right? and, and tell them what he's going to say, which is I was defending myself with first degree on the table, which to me, you know, I went, I'm, you know, being older, I'd be ter I'm terrified of juries. Yeah. If somebody charged me with something. No matter what it is, no matter how outrageous it was. And they said I had to go do a jury. I'm like, we literally have a body of people that just you just now taught me the law. This is the law. OK, that's it. That's what happened to us. We go sit down. They say, here's the rules. Find them guilty or not. If you think they're guilty, we don't have no way of really questioning you that it wasn't a a, a, a peer judgment of yours. Like, I just think he's guilty. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's going to deal with your life. And this young man went to, and got on the stand. And what he said was him. And this this is the sum of it. And then we can flesh out the detail. But him and Larry Perry, they met up, uh, got in an argument about the tire things. Uh, they asked him about a gun. He admitted, yeah, I had a nine millimeter. Identified that specifically. Uh Seen Larry Perry, you said, I seen he had a gun, but it didn't escalate into that. The escalation came when two other individuals showed up and was mad at him and Larry Perry for uh, essentially making the hood hot, I guess. Getting stuff, go, you know, getting a lot of stuff going on. And he said they started yelling at Larry Perry. So Larry, little Larry, that's the, that's the young man that died. And he's like, at that point, I was done with it. So Shalomar walks off. And as he's getting down and, that, and then I, I read the transcript and he jumps over a fence and as he's going down the way, he hears shots. So he hits the deck. This is in his transcript. So, so somebody he, else, he, I was there, but somebody else shot him. Yeah. Well, after I left. And it's them too. Well, they're, no, no, no. He's saying they're shooting at me. Oh, I thought they shot him. I thought they continued to argue. Well, that's the curious part is why are they not? I don't I don't I haven't seen or heard nobody say anything about interrogating these two. OK, you know? <laughs> there's clearly something here. Right. And per this prosecution, they're doing what they're doing, you know, trying to pick and pick at everything. So they verify oh. that this shooting happens between parties in some degree. Uh, they verify like the nine millimeter had reference because one of the things that was said early on is when Larry got shot, there might've been some downward shots into him, but there's, it's very vague on even the prosecutors. When they argue now, they don't talk about these other shots. They just reference them. So it's extraordinary vague. Holy shit. Can we pause? Sure. <laughs> yeah. I took the work van. Fucking shit. I was like, why is she calling me? I took the work van to, to get rid of stuff from the, the house. The van was stolen. High speed chase. <laughs> Which, you know what that means. 
It's going to come to my door. What you said you took the. It's the, the work van so I could get rid of all this drywall that I removed from the, the house early in the morning. The van was stolen in the pursuit and wrecked, and I need to know where you parked it. <laughs> oh, you shit. need to call them? Let me call I them. may leave this in. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're fine, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I just can't believe it. Do you need to call them? Call them. I'm going to call her real quick. But now, lucky me, I get to fall into one of those face. Like, I don't. Dude, I hope. I hope I didn't. And she's in a training. Here, we'll go on. And I guess I'll just go down there after this and <laughs> deal with whatever that is. Man, how does. Oh, man. How do I get, how, how am I getting associated in this stuff? Oh, and I'm not living that life. And now I have to worry about like, what? okay. You're still yeah. around it. So is the van from the region where I parked it? Did you, it, and the key's not in your purse? Where's your purse? Yeah, with the big thing. It better be. All right. Is this an emergency I have to deal with right right now? Well, did they say that it was broken into or did I left the key in there? That would help. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. I'll deal with it, but I'm going to take a quick second to run and look and see if that key is there. All right. Bye. All right. Give me two minutes. Yeah. Jeez, man. I hope this ain't my fault. I don't see the key. <laughs> you know the part where I said how the, the police, the sheriffs came my door? Yeah. Yeah. They said that we bought this house in 2020. They they had a picture of somebody clearly shot from the door looking out. You just see his back. They say they're looking for him. They came to my door when I looked at the ring camera because I didn't look at it right off. Right. I just walked. I was just happened to be by the door, so I just started moving that way. They covered my ring camera, and they went around the house. There was three of them, but and I know they was on some bullshit because as soon as I started talking to them, and I'm like, "Are you see? You know, like I don't know this dude. I don't even know who you're talking about." Blah blah blah. And then you guys just show up and you know, all here. But they came together, and then they was trying to tell me stuff, and then they just left. And that's how I knew you guys are on some bullshit. And when I looked at the thing later on, I'm like, holy shit, how bad could this have went for me? Because this is the perfect scenario where something happens to somebody like, dude, didn't have nothing to do with it. We just moved funny. Well, Especially the part where I'm ducking down and thinking I'm right. about running for no reason. And now I'm stuck in something else. So who was the ring? Who was on the ring camera? Who, no, I the, mean, they come up on the steps and he has something black and he puts it on like the boop. Yeah. Cause I put it on TikTok, and apparently that's a. I didn't know that was a thing. How much the cameras get messed on? I just, you know, how you can go do the green screen. I say, look what happened to me this morning, and I move out the way, and I just post the video. The sheriff walks right. up, it just but covers I, my. I know that, but you said that they had a picture of the back of somebody. Yeah, yeah, somebody that but apparently. Yeah, them. yeah, but I, we bought this house in 2020, so never seen the person. Still, right. you know, I thought maybe I didn't say nothing, but I was like, maybe I would know this person if he's been in and out the system. And but I don't know who they're talking about. Right. And they didn't have no reason to believe him because he was he wasn't ever there. So but they just came to my house just on a humbug and surrounded it because I got a ring camera on the side so I can see them how they approached when I'm looking at it later on. And I'm like, gee, I said, man, you need to approach the first case is like, don't let's not do something wrong and treat him like he's guilty. Maybe we spread out if we think possibly. Well, anyway, so, now so I, got what, this. I mean, you're having bad luck, you know, you should move to the suburbs and get a job <laughs> uh, doing people's books. You wouldn't have these problems. Um, yeah. So what's, what's going So what happened? What, 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 what where are we? Where, where okay, shall, with uh, the case, uh, yeah. yeah. Outside of me having to deal with somebody stole our work, man. And crashed it in a high speed chase. They didn't just steal it, and we're just like, "Where is it at?" Well, you got your drywall out of it, right? Yeah, <laughs> you're good. Yeah, 
I got Sounds trackings right. of where I was. The whole book of uh, mileage. and oh, All right. All right. Rewind back. So Shalimar goes to trial. His own first degree. Doesn't Nobody testifies at Ernest's trial because Ernest went first. They have their own murder trial. Shalimar decides to play, take the stand, which is, uh, you know, either courageous or really not very intelligent, you know, thought out. Right. Because you got to convince a jury that not only am I uh, not guilty, but I'm telling you I'm a shooter. He right. gets up on the stand and says, I have a gun and I shot at them. Right. So here's well, OK. Yeah. But for, for a jury, a, the jury has been given one charge and they're saying this is what he's guilty of. It's premeditated murder. He went there to kill him and he killed him. And so that he goes and says, no, there's an alternative to that yeah. where I was there. Guys, a couple of guys showed up and chased me off and actually shot at me. When I, you know, I jumped the fence and they were shooting at mm -hmm. me. So he's saying I was there, but I didn't kill him. So he's giving them an alter. He's giving them reasonable doubt. Right. right? So remember, that's what this is felony murder rule, which is what? a theory that says you are we. You do got that charge, but that premeditated is out. You just have to believe that a death happened. So if right, it's but, self defense, it's. There's no homicide if because he's shooting up there because they don't never there's no talk in the thing about other people killing Larry. No, I, I understand. But I'm saying so now the jury's being faced with this guy wasn't even there. Like he showed up, but he left. And then later someone got killed like he didn't he didn't kill him. So, nope. they so what, what's happening is down. now it's like, well, I'm sorry. They say he went down. No, I'm going to let you finish and then I'll clarify a few facts. OK, but, I was just going to say so to the jury. The, they're saying, well, I mean, the state is saying that he went there and shot him and killed him. He's yep. saying I went there, argued with him and got chased off by some other guys. They showed up. They were angry at us. So I, I left. And then something, maybe these guys killed him later. Like, I don't know, but I wasn't there. So that's reasonable doubt for the jury. And to me, the jury's like, OK, well, we have an alternative. And the cops are and the state's not saying doesn't have proof that that's not true. So that's reasonable doubt. So to me, it'd be like, OK, well, then it's not premeditated. Like he didn't right. go there to kill him. He wasn't there when he was killed. So I can't find him guilty of murder of, of first degree murder because he wasn't even there. And, and, the, and, the, and the state isn't doesn't have anybody to say that he was there and that he fired the gun or do they? They still have Alexis Fulton. He's testifying at everybody's. Oh, trial. he is every single one. So he's saying, yeah. nah, he didn't run. He was there. He got shot. He got he he shot, shot and killed them. Okay. I'm so what thinking, happened? So he, he <laughs> said, yeah. So it's a really confusing case, but Alexis Fulton now knows everybody, including these other people. Cause some of them are friends. So uh, my understanding is there's some loose connection between him and the other two that are identified here as you know coming into the argument but when larry perry leaves he says yeah i th i thought they were shooting at me so i hit the ground and then they're like you know clarifying did you shoot back and he's like yes i turned and shoot back and i think i've seen somebody go down but they were shooting at me right and then i get up and i run so potentially did he shoot up there and hit the dude right you maybe he shot him but that still would have been it would have been an accident. It would it have been still like, would have been defense because somebody's shooting at you. Right, right. And that would, yeah. Yep. So, but part of the things is they 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 keep alluding to somebody took shots at Larry Perry and maybe another gun when he's close. Nobody, nobody ever that I ever seen these other two people become suspects in this crime. That turns out not to be a crime because it's based on Shalimar Cooper Ryder shooting and killing and then maybe his friends they ask him about Ernest. he says Ernest wasn't there dante wasn't there the other two co-defendants okay and they say well we know there was other people present he's like yeah they weren't with nobody we was up here and they came in and was pointing at me and him talking about we're making all this noise and stuff's happening with tires around the thing and you're bringing all this heat in or whatever and i'm like yeah i'm not part of this now i'm bouncing and then they take shots at me I hit the deck. I take shots back. 
and then I run. So that's the essence of his things. The jury right. gets to look at all that. And they they say, based on the evidence and with all this testimony, self-defense, as you said, there is that other scenario and it matches what we see and believe. Self-defense, which is it means not a procedural default, meaning like somebody messed with something or somebody made a, a lawyer made a mistake and your case gets overturned or new trial or something. It's it's the actual part of what we hear at trials where is a person guilty or not? And you're not guilty for defending yourself. Right. So he's not guilty no murder. of the charge of first degree murder. So the answer is not guilty because not guilty. there's no other charge they could charge him with. Not like they could say manslaughter. He accidentally killed the guy. Well, That's not even on the table. There's no other charges. None. So, so yeah. had they charged him with assault or or uh, manslaughter and first degree, you know, they could have given him a different variations, but they only gave him one choice, and it he doesn't fit that choice. So it's not guilty. Period. Not guilty. That's kind of like the Casey Anthony thing, right? Like she was given, like they gave the jury. One th one charge. It was you know it was first degree murder. She killed the girl, meant to kill her, buried the body. They didn't, could have given her man. You know they could have also said well, or it could be manslaughter. They would have probably found her guilty of manslaughter. What they said was, you're saying for sure. Do we know that she premeditated murdered her daughter? We don't know that. Like there are other options, right. and you didn't give us the ability to charge her with anything less. So she's not guilty. Like, prosecutors fuck up when they do that. Yeah. Because the, they, they think it's all or nothing. Yeah, they think it's all or nothing. So they they a lot of times they'll be like, that's our only charge. He he's definitely guilty of something. Maybe not this, but fuck it. It's the only thing we can do. So they they charge him with the first degree murder. Yeah. And they yeah. and they also don't know what he's facing. Yeah. So they're probably thinking, oh, he's probably only facing five or ten years. And then they find out he gets life. And they're like, oh, wow, I didn't know that. So, but I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no. That, yeah, I never thought about that with the K Casey cases. Yeah. They put Everybody's it like, well, why didn't and they're like, yeah. You know, people are like, they're like, well, we think she did something, but we don't know for sure that she meant to kill her daughter. We think maybe she was trying to just get her to go to sleep and pass out so that she could go out partying and she gave her too much chloroform or maybe she accidentally suffocated or, you know, like there, it could be anything. We don't know 100% that it was premeditated murder. So then it becomes, okay, well, that's your only charge. Well, then the answer is no, not no. guilty. And people are like, and then they're screaming, you let her go. Wait a second. You're telling me she's, I had to be sure she was guilty of this. I'm not. I could have charged her with manslaughter. I could have charged her with, you know, assault. I could have charged her with child endangerment. Like there's lots of things I could have charged her with. You didn't charge her with those things. That's not my fault. That's your fault as the prosecutor. He built some of the nation's largest banks out of an estimated $55 million because 50 million wasn't enough and 60 million seemed excessive. He is the most interesting man in the world. I don't typically commit crimes, but when I do, it's bank fraud. Stay greedy, my friends. Support the channel. Join Matthew Cox's Patreon. Yeah, so that's man. the problem. That's, but that, a lot of time, that's what they do. People are so outraged, they figure, well, we'll get it. We'll only give them one option, and they'll take it because they don't have another option. And they think she she did something. We don't know for sure it's this, but this is our only charge. So give it to her. And the truth is. As in Casey's case has shown, you know, basically publicly, people believe she's guilty of something. Yeah, I and definitely what think they did was like, we're just trying to get you to say what you said. Reasonable doubt shows me when you say first degree and premeditated, and that's all that's on the table is that premeditated part. Like what well, we, we don't know. We don't necessarily believe it. So everybody thinks yeah. now that you say that, I can see the scenario. Everybody thinks it's like, oh, you just let her walk. Like, no, they for we. The only thing they left us to say is we're going to ignore our reasonable doubt that it wasn't premeditated. Right. You're saying that she gave us no other charges. Home. You're saying that she thought about killing her daughter, came home, executed her daughter, buried her daughter. Like, I don't think that's what happened. Do I All think right. she was involved? Do I think that she, you know, obviously I don't think her father killed her. You know, I don't think she accidentally drowned. Maybe she did. 
I don't think so, but I think she probably did give her something. Maybe she gave her chloroform. Maybe she, you know, and she gave her too much and she ended up, you know, suffocating the, or, and, and died or, you know, but I don't think she was trying to kill her because I just don't see that, you know, uh, but she, I definitely think she did something to that girl, which is, you know, manslaughter. Man, she should yeah. go to prison for five to 10 years, maybe 15 even. But I don't think that she sat there one day and said, you know, I'm going to kill my daughter. Yeah. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah. I, she's a pain in the ass. Cause the truth is you could have given her your, your, your parents are basically raising her anyway. And so you give them to her. that's what this felony murder rule does is it overrides that because Ernest, so they have two charges, but one's the gun using the gun. When they said, we don't believe you, you use the gun. They're saying, we don't believe you're the shooter, but because of this felony murder rule, we just got to believe a felony happened. And we believe somebody shot and killed this young man. We believe you was with them. That's just, stupid. we didn't know it was going to be self-defense because the same rule applies to here. So they could have just charged him. Like you had a gun. And if you got any other felony on your record, that's a felony. You had, uh, assaulted him. Maybe they, uh, I don't think he said he hit him or nothing. Cause well, he, well, I mean, he said it, that it's happened like, earlier in the day with Ernest. It's like you and I hook up. We're hanging out one day. You know, we're walking around. You're 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 showing me that yeah, this happened, this happened. A couple of guys come up. They they bump into us. Then we get into an argument. One of the guys is like, "I'll kill you, bro." You pull your gun out and you execute them, and then you take off running. And then I'm freaking out, so I don't stick around. I leave because yeah. it's a bad neighborhood. I take off. The cops come. They they put me on trial because I'm with you. You killed the guy. I didn't kill the guy. Like, I can't take the stand because I'm a felon. So I don't want him to bring up all my felonies. And so what happens is I go to trial and now I got a life sentence because you, I didn't know you had a weapon on you. I didn't no. know you were going to shoot these guys. I don't know anything about this. Some guy gets on the stand and says, yeah, man, I looked out the window. They were all arguing. That guy Cox was there. He, yeah, he definitely, I saw him shove one of the guys. I, what the hell? And the jury only has one choice. One choice. All that, or nothing. Right. And, and then I knew there was a gun. Yeah. You know, like, I didn't know there was a gun, but who's going to believe me? And I can't take the stand. Yeah. And yeah. So, so, uh, go ahead. Sorry. When, when, when Shalimar gets acquitted, so he gets acquitted later on, has to go to sentencing. Same judge. So the same judge gets to see somebody get acquitted for and heard a, uh, and heard that no, nobody places Ernest there. Yeah, this this because he was asked early on, like, who was there? And then when he was like, you know, I went myself at this time. And then the other two came in. They were like, what about uh, Ernest Jackson and Dante Chillis? And he's like, neither was there. And that got brought up a couple of times. And he no longer has a reason to defend Ernest. He can say yeah. he's there because. What else is going to happen to Ernest? He's guilty of first degree murder now. Yeah, if he was going to put him there, yeah. that was the time to do it. And I'm going to tell you the truth. It's amazing that anybody could get off with first degree just from being in the hood and saying, you know, I got in an argument. They, some guys came at me. I ran. They took some shots. I took some shots. Somebody yeah. up there got killed and somebody's trying to say I did it, like that I, I'm the murderer. Like, no, I, I didn't do this. Like, man, yeah, dude, I'll, I'll be thinking, like, don't say nothing, bro. You're, well, you, you're going to be thought, fighting for your life right now. And you want the jury to hear you say you did it? Well, you, you want to hear you the jury. Ad, we say. You want to hear the jury admit, one, you were there, and two, you had a gun, and three, you fired the gun. You fired the gun. Like, all of these are bad. In a jury's mind, it's like, this guy's a lunatic. Yep. Give him first degree. And, and if people need that different context of that, just think of this jury is all strangers to you. So no matter what they're making, if your life's on the line, do you want all strangers to be weighing judgments on you? And you're looking over there like, do they already think I did it? Because I'm charged. When you get charged, yeah. people think, what did you do? Yeah. Now I'm going to sit there and tell you all the elements you need to help you. But that's not what happened. Yeah, I had a gun. Yeah, I fired the gun, as you said, you know, but that's not that's not how it happened. And hope I can go home because well, I will never go home when I if you find me guilty here. Right. And I might have shot the guy because huh? they were shooting at me. I may have shot the guy because they were shooting at me. Yeah. 
Like they, he's they even they admitted he him. may have shot him. He, he, he damn sure may have shot him. <laughs> but it was yeah. self defense. So yeah, I I okay. So 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 Ernest goes to. I'm sorry. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Ernest goes to it's sentencing. Sentence. Same judge. Yep, they put a pill in and try to you know pill the, the conviction because like look, and they're like you know this is just this is what I got to do and life sentence. Judge gives him a life sentence. Life Seventeen sentence. year old. Well, he's eighteen by now. Yeah, he's, he's turning eight. Yeah, he's turning eighteen as this is this all is going. But he was seventeen the whole time through his trial and everything. Yeah, and then and then as that's as he's moving into the system, of course he's putting a pill in, and them pills take a while. But in the meantime, third trial, Dante Chillis, Shalimar Cooper Ryder testifies. You know, because his case is over. Same thing. He doesn't change testimony, and they uh, acquit so Dante he Chillis. Testifies that he wasn't there. Yeah, he just said the same thing he said in his own trial when he was fighting for his life, and he went and. So, and again, yeah, I had the same judge, but different jury. And that matters because now there's a different group of strangers listening to your thing thinking, well, this one's saying he's shooting and now he's trying to say his buddy's not there. I don't think they have the right to, you know, this is not like a big old public thing. This is a shooting in the, the neighborhood. This is a normal, you know, as horrible as that sounds, this is just a normal street Occurring. crime. Right. You know, so, so there's not like, oh, we know about this stuff. We know about this crime. So you know, separate jury, separate people, obviously, hearing yeah. the whole case for the first time. And they also believe the young man that testified, Shalimar Cooper Riders, like this is what happened. And to start out with, he wasn't there. Well, what happened? Because you know the prosecutor's gonna like drag that out so we can so they can hear all these dirty details and hear it differently. But they didn't, right. they heard it, they was like, no. We don't believe he was a part of this. So it wasn't even about a self-defense at this time. It's about, was he, because Shalimar's presented, I I was involved in this, in this capacity. He wasn't there. That's what right. they're holding on to. Now all they got to do is like, do we believe this or not? And they, and they yes, they did. So it was he like, was yeah. Not guilty. So there, there's that biter of being in the front of that line Meant nobody could, you know, the person that actually there and has some active involvement in it, not going to say nothing because he's fighting for his own life. And now I'm fighting to get out of this. I have hope, Ernest, because the, he got acquitted of self defense. One, he said it wasn't there and he's acquitted of self defense. So Shalimar is acquitted. He's not guilty. And what's not the guilty. other guy's name? Dante Chillis. Dante's also found not guilty. Not guilty. After. So had Ernest gone to trial the third as the third person at this time and had Shalimar gotten on the stand and said the same thing since he's already said his story twice mm -hmm. and gotten two um, not guilty verdicts, then it, it's reasonable that Ernest would have also gotten a not guilty. Yep, yep. And then there's that element that uh, if they're just because, again, I've seen no I found nothing nor heard anybody I've talked to that there's investigation have ever done on these other two individuals. They're just sticking with, well, well, we don't we don't know what else uh, to say. But that guilt is he's convicted. And so Shalimar is still the shooter. Right. Because they never yeah. put nobody else in the scenario. They just keep sticking with Ernest. We got Ernest. So. We got him. This is so we got this Ernest is that was with Shalimar. That's yep. already been found that he that not guilty. We've we've we found Ernest guilty of being at a first degree murder that has already been found to not have been a first degree murder. Right. Yeah. Because when the person we're saying is the shooter and the killer is acquitted of self defense, it means. There murder no didn't happen murder. at all. It's not a right. homicide. It's a shooting death. It's a tragedy, but it's not a criminal. So Which means he now he's an accessory to a non-crime because right. they acquitted right. him the gun. They didn't say we 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 think he was doing some of that shooting. Right. So you're not even saying that you he had the gun. He was yeah. found not guilty of that. So what what does the court of appeals do? 
Well, they immediately let him go, didn't they? <laughs> yeah, because, you know, they're going to do the right thing. Right, That's right. Yeah, I've watched Law and Order. I watched Law and Order. I know yeah. how it works. Yeah, they they walked up in there and was like, time to go home. And everybody was happy. And no, nope. nope. he packed his bag. They that warden told me he was sorry. The prosecutor drove him home, apologized to his mother yeah. and his aunt, said, I'm sorry, I took your baby away from you for the last three or four years. My bad. We're going to try and work some kind of a deal out, cut you a check. Yeah, I know how it is. They're 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 yeah. good people. It's a, yeah, it's amazing. This this uh, legal system is like this is like one of the prime cases that I've seen is like, man, well, they'll use words and take your life with words. And that's yeah. what they did in the court of appeals. They said the testimony of Shalimar Cooper Ryder, because that's what he's saying. It's like, dude, look, he's saying I'm not there. He got acquitted. He went home. This is a whole case. But I wasn't there. Right. That's all I know. That's all. That's all you should know is this testimony came out. Bunch of new stuff. This guy laid out the case. He was part of it. Right. I'm like me. I'm only a part of it because you put a charge on me. Right. At the very least, that's a new trial. Yep. So that's what they do is they say new trials require the language. We'll, we'll do the air quote thing. Newly discovered evidence, right? That's the word. Newly discovered evidence equals new trial. And their argument is not newly discovered evidence. The legal language they use is it's newly available language. We believe whatever it, this man's testimony was available to you. But it wasn't. He took the fifth. But he took the fifth. So we have right here is uh, what some of us have been talking about is the battle of constitutional rights could actually hurt somebody. And in this case, you know, snatch up your, your youth and all that. And you're in prison for 20 something years because they're saying I have the right when I'm on defense to know that, hey, there's testimony over here that, you know, I can subpoena police and put them on the stand. I can right. subpoena, you know, regular citizens and put them on the stand, except if they say I have to defend myself and I have the right to remain silent because it might incriminate me. And so I I'm not going to testify at your trial because I might end up with a charge or in this case, I'm not going to testify at your trial because I have murder charges, which I can lose my life. And I have a trial that I need to focus on, not the here to come over here so people can change the wordings or like, oh, that's how he's coming at it or whatever they want to do. Strategically, the lawyer is like, I'm doing what's in your best interest. So he his lawyer is like, he's not going to testify. Right. Yeah, because he's, he's representing yeah. his client. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, you're going first. But that's not our concern. My concern is my client. Shalomar is not going to testify. And. So that's what the court of appeal says is that he doesn't have the right to this testimony of this is like saying some I got charged with all these weird murders all over town. I'm in prison. Oh, guy confesses. Oh, you can't get that. You kind of knew that guy <laughs> that confessed. That was new, yeah. not newly developed, no discovered. Because since you knew the guy, maybe you knew what he was going to say. Yeah, but I can't I can't even personally testify that that guy's going to say he was acting in self-defense and he did it. Well, what is that adding about you? Nothing, because I wasn't there. He has right. nothing. So the language is newly discovered equals newly new uh, new trial. Newly available equals nothing. And by so, putting that, they killed it, all testimony to be used by him. So did he appeal it to the state Supreme Court? Yeah. First, he went through the Court of Appeals. He went through the, you know, this whole appeal process. And why wouldn't he? Because. He didn't do anything. Even to this day, you're you're probably still thinking like, how did that not get me out? Right. Not probably. He is. <laughs> like, how did that not get me out of prison? How did somebody go up and say I'm the shooter and go home because the jury is like, yeah, but you didn't act criminally? And I sit there because the belief is I was present. <laughs> right. So, but. Okay, so what did the state Supreme Court say? Uh, they all agreed once that once that was that's how it got it. That that's that's now a thing in our laws is newly discovered, newly available. This 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 has started getting argued 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 in the courts because uh, the Jackson case happened in ninety nine. I on my gang stuff and all my bullshit. I was involved in a lot of shit, terrible stuff. 
that I'm, I feel like that's where I'm at now is kind of my walk of paying back is what I'm doing with my life now. As right. opposed to, I just did some time and let me live. And that's cool. Let me live a good tax paying and take care of family and not cause trouble. Cool. I think that's great. That's most of your success examples. I chose to be in the community and volunteering and putting in work and, and now think of where I'm going with, <laughs> I like the ramble, I guess. Right. I, yeah, yeah. I get it. So yeah. you're now you're kind of an advocate for, um, Ernest. Ernest, and, because right. nobody talked about it. This happened. I, he didn't even talk about it. I knew I got to meet him in prison. I only seen one time when he first went to prison and they were talking about the case on news. He was in another prison. Didn't know him. Like, okay. Then he came over and I was reading, trying to figure out how to get out of my case because I was guilty of my stuff. Right. My stuff happened a little wishy-washy. The, the second time I went twice. I had right. shot another gang member. I did do that. I didn't kill him. Thank God, because now I had I would have to live with that. But I did do that. And then the next time was a robbery that I got called and I got involved in. And I did do that. But I lived a lot of time inside thinking, no, dude snitched on me. That's all I could think about. Not about what my part was, because the dude that told set it up, called me down. Please, yeah. I get shot up. I get what I deserve in the case. Yeah, it was internal house busted into home invasion, the worst type of robbery without uh like sexually assault and you know murder happening in the yeah. case worst i could think about is you know you kick somebody somebody kicks your door in when does your house ever feel secure again you can have yeah. 100 guns but people just kicked your door in yeah i always think yeah. about that like you're sitting there doing the right thing and some guy comes and just kicks in your door like and that's, that's what we did to somebody and that's what you know and living a different life i think about that i actually got the the people couple of them called me because it was situation and I just did what I believe is the right thing is go and whatever they got to say you don't defend yourself you be right. honest and you know what not and I think that helped a little but the stories they told me is like usually think about trauma like yeah that was traumatic and but it happened like 20 years ago and then they're talking about they spent like 10 years you know can't trust the door locks had to move out in the country and I'm like you know all because of what we did right yeah so anyways, so I'm inside looking at my case back to Ernest and I had met him. So I knew him around the yard and I read his case and I was like, dude, this is the first you are in prison for a non-crime because you can't have murder if the shooter is acquitted of self-defense. Right. And he was like, wait, what? Cause he told me later on when I talked to him, he's like, dude, I never thought about it being non crime All I could think is like, dude, I wasn't there. And the guy said it. And why is it? How is that? I can't get out. I can't get out of this thing. And I'm like, you know, right. so that thing comes. So I get out in 2016 and I'm just half and 2020 happens. We all know what that is. COVID and George Floyd. And then here in Nebraska, it, it got kind of hectic too, little old Nebraska, but there was this point where the senators, agreed to have uh open hearings where people can your grievances your stories whatever and i chose to talk about that case i talked about Derek dixon and ernest jackson because these are both falls under that felony murder rule where right. one burglarized a house lady had a heart attack life sentence ernest jackson you know as we're talking yes <laughs> accessory to what the the shooter is acquitted of and still in prison 20 something years later and that opened the door up again because and then we we did a whole bunch of advocacy and now it's moving again and when it get moving it got some cases in the courts like some senators a particular two senators but one senator put it forth senator wayne and terrell terrell mckinney are really big advocates on this and uh they put some bills to try to you know change a little bit of this language like hey this, right you know <laughs> we have a confession Right. And the argument is always opposed every time by the, by the, the, prosecutor. the prosecutor's office and all that. Every time there's like no give because their biggest thing is what if this opens the floodgates and thousands of appeals Bullshit. come in? It's one or two guys. It's one or two so, guys. The law was written so that it goes before a judge. He looks at what you present and then he decides should this be a new trial or not. So that's the gatekeeper is like the judge gets to look at it and decide but why would you not ever have 
a, a process that always reviews to make sure something else ain't changed. Right. But that, that's where we talked about the system. Once we got you, we are not interested in in admitting our mistakes or whatnot. No, no. The justice system isn't really about justice. Um, so. So what do you think their fear? I, I understand that they, their 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 argument is what if it opens up the floodgates and thousands of people are let go when they know for a fact that's not going to that that's not going to happen. Are you yeah. you think that their concern is that if they were released, they would be able they would open up their ability to sue them? Yeah. Beatrice six. I've never heard it said, but after that, Beatrice six, that's the people that confessed, didn't confess. And then they got, they talked to them and talked to them. And then they confessed all on tapes and recordings and stuff. And then 20 years later, however, that broke, they all got out and then they sued successfully. And then the county was like it bankrupting us. And people were like, why do we have to pay them? And so even if they're, they don't really care, like we got plenty of money. We could throw this dude like $10 million and he'll be good at no big, no, they care politically, you know, What's it look like? Cause and we've been and they've been sticking their guns like he did something. We feel he did something. He wouldn't be in jail if he didn't do something. And that works. It doesn't work on the mass of us because a lot of us are out here of different political sways and whatnot. And like, dude, there's something. They this is just you know some of us just see it. It's pretty clear that reasonable doubt minimum was there all day long. But once that person confessed, you don't keep anybody in prison. For somebody's confession to being a shooter and they go home but you're doing that here so why is that a fight well, you why know, is that I mean, a fight? well i mean like you said i i mean it's you know obviously it's political and it, it's political and obviously you know they are concerned i'm sure you know about being sued so i mean it's probably a combination of the two yeah but what what always kills me is that that prosecutor sleeps knowing all of this sleeps like a baby at night he tells himself every night that what he's done is the right thing and he feels good about it like that he yeah. they go and they lay down at night and they think they're making the world a safer place by putting some 17 year old in prison for the rest of his life who didn't do anything who was playing video games your biggest problem is what you did to end up with a life sentence was hang out with your cousin and play video games. That's my crime. I was playing video games with my cousin and somebody else named me. That's my, that's my crime. That's it. That's it. He, and I'm going to do a life had an sentence. opportunity to get out Ernest Jackson. They had an opportunity to let him out and change this. It did change some. So Alabama versus Miller is the federal case, I believe, or state case, whatever, that expanded. And what it said is uh, the court ruled saying, we believe that when it comes to juveniles, that when we have a sentencing structure that they fall under, that says mandatory life. So that means the judge doesn't have no other. When you're guilty of this, mandatory means you don't get to say like, no, I think there's a little difference in this scenario or you're really young. And I believe in 10, 15 years, you'll be a different person. None of that. And so that affected states all over the country. Right. And so as time was ticking, people were going to get resentenced and Ernest in like 2014, 15, I don't remember exactly what year he got a chance to go resentence. Cause I remember everybody in, I was still inside going home, you know, he's going home, right. You know, he's not going to get, you know, acquitted or, or vindicated because it's a resentencing. It's not a retrial, but at least you can go home and do this fight on the street. They're going to give. Right. What happened was the prosecutor went up there and said, none of that testimony of the other man doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. He was convicted of a first degree murder. And we are here for a resentencing based on the mandatory language. You can give him life. You can give him life. You can give him a hundred years, whatever but he's convicted of first degree murder. That person that they're trying to talk about, you know, he got acquitted because he, he said Ernest wasn't there and said he did the shooting and the jury, whatever, you know, none of that matters. You know, I'm definitely paraphrasing. Right. But th those were definitely said very, <laughs> very dramatic about that. And you know what the argument was? 
In fact, when you look at this, you should look at and remember he has like a couple hundred misconduct reports over the past 15, 16, 17 years. So because he was in prison and he's not a uh, he's not an um you know a perfect inmate because he didn't make his bed or because he, he argued argued he with fought. the huh maybe he even got in a fight because here's the bigger thing about the misconduct reports it's not just about us saying they're all petty we're talking about we're all going to a place where the the whole environment is survival mode. Yeah. Even in little old Nebraska, people oh, get I've been there, people been drugged and raped, people been assaulted, people been killed in our system, you know, in arguments. You everything survival mode. Yeah, you have days where everything's cool, but then you have days where them guys are thinking like, yeah, I don't like who you hang out with. Association will do you there. And right. and unlike myself, I was like 18, 19 when I went in, but so I was close enough. But 17. That's how his whole life is lived. Right. And supposed to be happy about it. Let me be a good, you don't get good 17 years old out here and they have misconduct, like we said, for everything. I seen you get a suit from somebody, misconduct report. You got extra socks in your cell. I don't care what the weather is outside, you double up on socks. Misconduct report. Oh, you want to talk to me? Misconduct report. Oh, it sounded like you was threatening me. Go into the hole. You know what I mean? Listen, oh, you want to argue guys, with I know guys that got shots for looking at a female officer too long. Mm. Like the guy's not, he's not, he's not like he's doing anything. He's literally 30 feet away and just glanced at her. And she'd say, what are you looking at? He said, Oh, I was just looking at you. I, I wouldn't mean to, it's just, Oh, okay. Wrote an incident report. <laughs> because yeah. what He called it. What we used to joke. You were uh reckless eyeballing. Yeah. You know, it's like, old school terminology. like, you know what I'm saying? It was just like, and here's the thing, like a lot of those shots you can fight and maybe get them turned, turned over. But the truth is, if you got a life sentence, what do I give a shit? Write yeah. it. What do I care? Cause you got to live, you got to find a way to adjust in there. Right. I don't, I, I don't, you, you want me to respect the rules? Cause it says me and my buddies can't get together and make some burritos. Cause we're now exchanging items and maybe that's a drug deal like dude i'm doing years yeah. i don't need life sentence i'm doing years we're gonna we're gonna get together and do that any damn way i gotta not say nothing when this guy's talking crazy to me or this guy takes swings at me i'm gonna take swings back i'm in here i gotta survive and now you're like hey maybe we should do a different sentence and we're saying like hey i shouldn't be doing that sentence at all but we're gonna argue about the sentencing and then your your review is look at all the time he got in trouble this little juvenile that we grew up in our system, and I'm now we're arguing trouble. And the judge, what he say, agreed. He not only agreed, there was a specific statement he made, because remember, Ernest was 17, close to turning 18. And he said something about, if it was but a couple of months, we wouldn't even be here. Essentially saying, if you would have been 18 when this would have happened, you'd still be doing life without parole. Because I wouldn't have to hear your case, because this only applies to juveniles. So what they do, they gave him, I believe it's 60 to 90 years, 60 to 80 years. That was their doing right. So he does have a parole date. And I think 2029, because that's like 30 years later. Yep. From 1999. But now there's this whole political thing about him. Like, you know, me thinking I'm doing, I brought this out and then I got it into the right hands and people are starting to do stuff with it. I'm thinking I'm doing him a favor. And now I'm wondering if I turned him into some sort of political prisoner where everybody right. plays games with his life rather than just the picture that I thought I was seeing that I thought other people would see as like, yeah, this somebody that doesn't belong in prison. Right. It doesn't matter. Like, here's the thing. It doesn't matter whether he got some disciplinary shots or not. He's not supposed to be in prison. It's like no. saying, it's like saying, you know, we're going to charge you with murder. And because, you know, okay, well, maybe we didn't, Maybe you didn't commit the murder, but you did something like you were there or you drove the getaway car. Okay. Yeah, that's you didn't charge me with that. You charged me with this and I'm innocent yeah. of that. Like, so you want to charge me with, you, oh, well, we found out that, you know, you sold drugs a couple of times. And so, well, well, well then go back and charge me with the drugs. Right. But don't charge right. me with this. Something I did. Right. If, right. If charge me with something I did. Or something you alluding process. that I did at least. Right. Not this. 
Yeah, yeah, because this is set this right. Yeah, now you have a whole nother thing. You're not going to be on the wrong side to say, okay, we didn't know all that until that guy got up. So we're going to, you know, but no, instead, they they're, they're just sick. That U.S. That, listen, that that state attorney and that judge don't want him in front of a camera saying the judge knew that these other two people had been acquitted. You know, I'm sorry, acquitted, acquitted. You know, they you know, he knew that he gave me a life sentence anyway. He knew there was no evidence. He knew. And let's face it, two juries found their only eyewitness uncredible. Yeah. Right. If they if they if if they acquitted those two guys, that means that they didn't believe the, the state's eyewitness. So the same state eyewitness that my jury found credible, two other juries found uncredible because they because they had a, a, a witness that disputed his eyewitness testimony, which I wasn't allowed. So regardless, that, that judge knew that the secondary judge could have dropped it. The prosecutor sleeps like a baby saying, oh, I, I took this 17 year old video game and playing motherfucker off the street you never play a video game again um you know like i mean what what does he tell himself but that's that's what happens is these guys get to be they think they're infallible and they they get these god complexes and everybody else is just a pawn to be moved around yeah yeah i guess i guess well not i guess what should be added is cases uh because one reason we don't hear from dante chillis or Shalimar Cooper Ryder, the other two that were, you know, as we've been speaking about, Shalimar's the one that got acquitted. Dante got acquitted based on Shalimar's testimony. You know, I did this in self-defense, blah, 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 is about four or five years later, both get shot and killed in different situations, different things that are unsolved deaths. So both of them are deceased in shooting okay. deaths. And I'm really curious on that because I'm like, it, you know, I don't know what happened. These, this is all speculation. But first, he identified one person by name and one as the friend. And he said other people that were identified in there probably know the friend's name. Like, where's the investigation of these other guys? They just picked these three and wouldn't get off of it. Then, so many years later, they get murdered. Maybe that's not connected. However, when you get on the stand, even when you're defending yourself and you're saying somebody else is there that potentially could have done something, you just fingered that person. Right. They in and if the person's living the life and they ain't drastically changed their life, they always remember like this dude almost put me in prison. Because right. if they would start looking into this as easily as they put Ernest in prison, I might be next. But for some reason. As you said, the prosecution wants us. We got our scenario. We, if we start bending that, bending our theory of these three, then we start breaking up the reality that we created that it's just got something to do with them three and the jury. Now the jury, if they would have convicted them of murder, as they did Ernest, would have been like that. See, that's how the court works. And it, and it works right, everybody. However, now it's kind of like suddenly there was something wrong with this jury. <laughs> which it takes a lot more to, to uh, acquit somebody than it does to convict somebody in our system. Oh yeah. Especially of something, you know, based on testimony and based on a little bit of the evidence, you know, they had the shooting, they had all the evidence that I have yet to see some of this stuff. But so I don't think that I don't for one moment doubt that they went back there and just like, I don't want to put somebody in jail or you know what they had a full discussion. They looked at stuff and they was like, this is what we got to do. And they did what they were supposed to do, the right thing in that case. Absolutely believe that's what happened. It wasn't like, man, I don't feel good about this, but I really feel like he was there. Right. You know, I get this guy saying he pistol whooped this guy and there's no evidence of this, but I don't know. This guy's words all over, but I still feel like he's there. And they was able to come together and convict Ernest for that. Much easier for that somebody to just like, yeah. This is terrible, you know, but we got to do this. Well, then they sit there and say, we're going to say not there. There's family probably crying because they only got the scenario that these three killed Larry Perry. That's all they get from the, the prosecutor. So what do they think in their whole life? That this these are responsible. These are the individuals responsible. And they're getting away with now stuff. 
Well, so what? what's up with the case now? Where does it stand now? So uh, it had several bills that have been put the past three years. Uh, as I said, to change the language, opposed every year. Attorney General, and then there's a political divide. They just keep saying, and there was actually a hearing last year where they took it to the floor after they had the, the hearing where you could speak, where the community could speak. They take it to their floor and repeatedly there was reference to that young man or Ernest Jackson. However, I I can't support this bill. <laughs> it might open up the floodgates. It might, you know, look at what they're saying. It's like this bill to have all these people just weighing down our systems with the pills now. You know what I mean? I'm so like, better, man. He, better he should sit in prison for the rest of his life than, yeah. than to do the right thing and, and have to do a little extra work. And nobody even blinks at that because you would think like, at some point, we would have a system where there shouldn't be tape, red tape all over it to be like, man, this is really, you can believe what you want to believe, but there's evidence that the shooter, before a jury, before a legal judge, with his whole life on the line, so there's no benefit, you know, there's no sneaky stuff of him trying to, I'm immune to stuff. Everything's on the line when he does this. Can't bet the testimony any better. If you want to take a statement and say, we want to make sure the statement is good. We you take a statement from a trial where your life is on the line to make this statement. That's what happened with Shalomar Cooper. I can't vet it better and go and do something like, Hey, the end, like release him. But we don't have that. That's a movie. We have a thing is like the law says. So essentially what we have is the, the showing kind of what we referenced earlier uh, or what I reference, I'll, I'll put that. Up. But I say Nazi Germany because it's deeper than people just think like, oh, you, why would you compare us to Nazis? Because there was a process there that got them there. It wasn't a bunch of evil Germans running around participating. It was a system that went into place and it was legally put. Hitler didn't right. just come in and steal the country under, you know, illegally. That stuff kept building and they kept giving rules and laws for him to do stuff. And then he started warping it and people fell in the line because, you know, what do I going to do? But at least yeah. there, if I do something, I might end up executed. Here you get ousted from your political, you know, spot or right, people talk about, you know, you're not getting executed per se for the most of us. You know, I'm sure that right. there are cases of, you know the civil rights movement and people got executed. But I'm saying like there, your neighbor points over there and like they're not following the law and you might end up in that same concentration camp the next day. We don't even have it that hard yet and we can't even overturn this rule of law that says, sorry, it was written this, so sorry. Yeah, That's a horrible system to have. Well, we're getting there. <laughs> we're getting we're there. <laughs> it's not gonna benefit nobody except for um, not. people in, yeah, except for people in power. Um. Okay, so you're saying there have been several. Are there any other bills? Are they coming up again, or what, what's happening? We had a bill this year, very interesting bill because this time the senators were really asking questions, and the chief prosecutor that's been the chief prosecutor in, Doug, in Douglas, that's our big county in Omaha, uh, uh, Don Klein. They asked them finally at the end because he was just like, "Nope, nope, I believe he he could have done something." We, I believe he did something. I don't blah, blah, blah. I don't believe in this other testimony. <laughs> you know, he's saying all that stuff. But the, the, the senator said, do you believe you ever uh, been involved in the case or any cases, you know, uh, put somebody that didn't do it, somebody that might have been innocent in prison? He's like, no, never. Never, never made a mistake because I'm right. superhuman is essentially it's like that's the worst person to have power is somebody that says, I don't believe so. But, you know. Yeah, saying it's not it's even possible. It's not possible that I'm fallible. Yeah, he said never. Well, I mean, that should have been enough for the senators right there. That yeah. should have been enough for them to know, okay, now, yeah. this and may be like, that case. That's Ernest gets a new trial. Are you going to challenge it? He's like, yes. He just, just, they just, it's scary, that, as you said, that they could even sleep comfortably. That there's no, like, Let's put the, a task team together and do a little bit more investigation in this case. Well, I think it's you. Be, I think that you just become desensitized, you know, uh, being a prosecutor to the point where it's an uh, it's 
all or nothing. It's, you know, us against them type of thing. Yeah. But well, yeah. I mean, anything else on this? Well, we continue to advocate for them. We got some things happening now. There's the best thing that's happened is there's a community and there's a growing community that are uh, finding out about this and looking for ways to, you know, try to get this push through some way, some form, some fashion, because even as we said, now he has a parole date. Let's say he gets, let's say for some reason, they're like, we don't want to hear about all that stuff. We're just going to give you parole. Cause we believe you, but he still got to do 30, 40, whatever amount of years on parole as a person well, guilty of this crime. The problem is too the parole board. A lot of times they don't want to give you parole unless you admit guilt. to what you did. He's going to go in front of them and be like, I didn't do it. They're going to be like, oh, he hasn't learned his lesson. Let Keep him in prison. Like People don't realize that. They're like, oh, well, he'll get parole. No, it's not guaranteed. And one of the nope. big things they want you to do is say, I did it. And a lot of these guys get up in there and they're like, I didn't do it. And they're like, oh, yeah, he's not. He's not ready to be paroled. So you may never get parole. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. Sorry. No, uh, I was just going to say, and he's now he's in that new scenario where they could just be like, we, we actually got a two-edged sword here. One, exactly what you said. You got to admit guilt before we'll give you parole. But let's say Ernest is like, you guys broke me. So I'm going to go up there and say everything they want just to get out. I'm going to say how I did this and I did that. Right. And then they sit there and be like, uh, we're well aware of your case. And now you're just going to come up here and lie because we know you're not telling the truth. We know, you know, and then he's like, you know, yeah, and that's yeah, the only yeah, scenario yeah, they have because no he way, chose that no route win. instead of this route. So there's no winning. If they choose to do what they do, and the fear is they they probably will. What about the Innocence Project? They're involved. There's okay. a it, yeah, it's been involved before and struggle with, and now there's the uh, I don't know which one just got involved. There's a pro bono lawyer, Daniel Gutman. Uh, he's also a professor at uh, UNL. Uh, he's gonna he's working on the case, seeing some angles. He's very great because he's in the community, so he gets involved with those of us out here that are trying to do what we do. And so there, there's some elements involved. It's that legal thing. Because as long as everybody sticks, as, as long as the words of the court says this, nobody can do nothing. Listen, I appreciate you talking to me about it. You know, one of my uh, one of my guys made a comment that, hey, you know, that I you need to talk to Jason about the um, about Ernest, you know, case and the Ernest Jackson case. And, you know, super interesting. And I um so he actually got me your information. He's the one that got me your information. Oh, no, I guess he gave you my information. Yes, your email. Right. I think it was Dusty. Right. So, so Dusty. Yeah. <laughs> so I yeah. listen, I appreciate it. I appreciate you coming on. Hey, if you like the video, do me a favor. Hit the subscribe button. Uh, hit the bell so you get notified of videos like this. Sh share the video. Also, um, I'm going to leave uh, Jason's contact information in the description. Uh, in the description box and uh, leave me a comment. And I really appreciate you guys watching. And as you, I'm sure you know, I wrote a bunch of books when I was incarcerated, true crime books about different cases. So uh, check out the trailers. Using forgeries and bogus identities, Matthew B. Cox, one of the most ingenious con men in history, built America's biggest banks out of millions. Despite numerous encounters with bank security, state, and federal authorities, Cox narrowly, and quite luckily, avoided capture for years. Eventually, he topped the U.S. Secret Service's most wanted list and led the U.S. Marshals, FBI, and Secret Service on a three-year chase while jet-setting around the world with his attractive female accomplices. Cox has been declared one of the most prolific mortgage fraud con artists of all time by CNBC's American Greed. Bloomberg Businessweek called him the mortgage industry's worst nightmare, while Dateline NBC described Cox as a gifted forger and silver-tongued liar. Playboy magazine proclaimed his scam was real estate fraud, and he was the best. Shark in the housing pool is Cox's exhilarating first-person account of his stranger-than-fiction story. Available now on Amazon and Audible. Bent is the story of John J. Boziak's phenomenal life of crime. Inked from head to toe, 
with an addiction to strippers and fast Cadillacs, Boziak was not your typical computer geek. He was, however, one of the most cunning scammers, counterfeiters, identity thieves, and escape artists alive, and a major thorn in the side of the U.S. Secret Service as they fought a war on cybercrime. With a savant-like ability to circumvent banking security and stay one step ahead of law enforcement, Boziak made millions of dollars in the international cyber underworld with the help of the Chinese and the Russians. Then, leaving nothing but a John Doe warrant and a cleaned-out bank account in his wake, he vanished. Boziak's stranger-than-fiction tale of ingenious scams and impossible escapes, of brazen run-ins with the law and secret desires to straighten out and settle down, makes his story a true crime con game that will keep you guessing. Bent. How a homeless teen became one of the cybercrime industry's most prolific counterfeiters. Available now on Amazon and Audible. Buried by the U.S. government and ignored by the national media, this is the story they don't want you to know. When Frank Amadeo met with President George W. Bush at the White House to discuss NATO operations in Afghanistan, no one knew that he'd already embezzled nearly $200 million from the federal government, money he intended to use to bankroll his plan to take over the world. From Amadeo's global headquarters in the shadow of Florida's Disney World, with a nearly inexhaustible supply of the Internal Revenue Service's funds, Amadeo acquired multiple businesses, amassing a mega conglomerate. Driven by his delusions of world conquest, he negotiated the purchase of a squadron of American fighter jets and the controlling interest in a former Soviet ICBM factory. He began work to build the largest private militia on the planet, over one million Africans strong. Simultaneously, Amadeo hired an international black ops force to orchestrate a coup in the Congo while plotting to take over several small Eastern European countries. The most disturbing part of it all is, had the U.S. government not thwarted his plans, he might have just pulled it off. It's insanity. The bizarre, true story of a bipolar megalomaniac's insane plan for total world domination. Available now on Amazon and Audible. Pierre Rossini in the 1990s, was a 20-something-year-old Los Angeles-based drug trafficker of ecstasy and ice. He and his associates drove luxury European supercars, lived in Beverly Hills penthouses, and dated Playboy models while dodging federal indictments. Then, two FBI officers with the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force entered the picture. Dirty agents willing to fix cases and identify informants. Suddenly, two of Rossini's associates, confidential informants working with federal law enforcement, were murdered. Everyone pointed to Rossini. As his co-defendants prepared for trial, U.S. Attorney Robert Mueller sat down to debrief Rossini at Leavenworth Penitentiary, and another story emerged. A tale of FBI corruption and complicity in murder. You see, Pierre Rossini knew something that no one else knew. The truth. And Robert Mueller and the federal government have been covering it up to this very day. Devil Exposed, a twisted tale of drug trafficking, corruption, and murder in the City of Angels. Available on Amazon and Audible. Bailout is a psychological true crime thriller that pits a narcissistic conman against an egotistical pathological liar. Marcus Shrinker, the money manager who attempted to fake his own death during the 2008 financial crisis, is about to be released from prison, and he's ready to talk. He's ready to tell you the story no one's heard. Shrinker sits down with true crime writer Matthew B. Cox, a fellow inmate serving time for bank fraud. Shrinker lays out the details. The disgruntled clients who persecuted him for unanticipated market losses, the affair that ruined his marriage, and the treachery of his scorned wife, the woman who framed him for securities fraud, leaving him no choice but to make a bogus distress call and plunge from his multi-million dollar private aircraft in the dead of night. The $11.1 million in life insurance, the missing $1.5 million in gold. The fact is, Shrinker wants you to think he's innocent. The problem is, Cox knows Shrinker's a pathological liar and his story's a fabrication. As Cox subtly coaxes, cajoles, and yes, cons Shrinker into revealing his deceptions, his stranger-than-fiction life of lies slowly unravels. 
This is the story Shrinker didn't want you to know. Bailout, the life and lies of Marcus Shrinker. Available now on Barnes & Noble, Etsy, and Audible. Matthew B. Cox is a con man, incarcerated in the Federal Bureau of Prisons for a variety of bank fraud-related scams. Despite not having a drug problem, Cox inexplicably ends up in the prison's residential drug abuse program, known as RDAP, a drug program in name only. RDAP is an invasive behavior modification therapy specifically designed to correct the cognitive thinking errors associated with criminal behavior. The program is a non-fiction dark comedy which chronicles Cox's side-splitting journey. This first-person account is a fascinating glimpse at the survivor-like atmosphere inside of the government-sponsored rehabilitation unit. While navigating the treachery of his backstabbing peers, Cox simultaneously manipulates prison policies and the bumbling staff every step of the way. The Program How a Con Man Survived the Federal Bureau of Prisons' Cult of RDAP Available now on Amazon and Audible. If you saw anything you like, links to all the books are in the description box.